Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. Oh my goodness. Okay, so let me get myself together here because this is actually a really emotional episode for me. As all of you know, I have managed a chronic illness for several years now, and it has been such a journey. It has been such a journey. And since I have started to be public about what I have gone through, so many of you have reached out to say, yes, me too. It is so hard to handle a chronic illness and anxiety at the same time. A lot of you who have a chronic illness or a disability may also suffer from health anxiety, generalized anxiety, OCD, you know, depression, a whole slew of additional mental health struggles. And today I wanted to introduce you to two incredibly courageous human beings who just I just loved this episode so much. I loved really hearing their story. So today we have Sandy Robinson and Jesse Birnbaum coming on. They are the amazing co-owners of the Instagram page called Chronically Courageous. You can go over and follow them. And they're on here talking about managing the anxiety of chronic illness and disability. I love how they weave their own experience of having medical and mental struggles and what skills they use and the emotional roller coaster of that and how to manage their energy levels and how health anxiety impacts their health medically and how their medical health impacts their mental health And we just go through it all. And it was such a beautiful episode. So I'm so grateful for them for coming on and again, speaking so beautifully and vulnerably and openly about their struggles and their wins and their challenges. And it was just absolutely an honor. All I want to say before we get over to the show is if you're someone who struggles with any of these topics, they really highlight the importance of community, the importance of support, feeling less alone. And I cannot highlight that enough. I think that that is a huge piece of the puzzle as you're managing and navigating these really difficult experiences, especially if you're experiencing them all at one time. So I'm just going to leave you with that and let us go over to the episode. Thank you again for our guests. And I just cannot wait to talk about this topic. Well, welcome. This is actually so near and close to my heart, this conversation. I am so honored to have Jesse Birnbaum and Sandy Robinson here talking about the anxiety of chronic illness and disability. So welcome and thank you both for being here. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Right. So for those of you who are listening on audio, we are that we are three here today. And so we're going to be talking back and forward. I'll do my best to let you know who's talking, but if anything, we're just you can look at the transcripts of the show if you're wondering who's saying what. But I am so happy to have you guys here. You're obviously doing some amazing work bringing awareness to those who have an anxiety disorder, you know, specifically health anxiety, OCD, you know, panic disorder. These are all very common disorders to have alongside a chronic illness and disability. Jesse, will you go first in just telling us a little bit about your experience of managing these things? Yeah, of course. So I've had OCD since I was a little kid but wasn't diagnosed until around age 14. So it took a little while to get that diagnosis. And then was totally fine, like didn't have any physical limitations, played a lot of sports, 
And then in 2020, which seems like it would coincide with the pandemic, I don't think it did. I started getting really physically sick. So started out with these severe headaches and has kind of continued on and morphed into new symptoms and uh, has been kind of identified as a general chronic illness. I'm still kind of searching for an overall diagnosis, but I've seen a lot of different ways in which my OCD has made my chronic illness worse, and then my chronic illness has made my OCD worse, um, which is really why Sandy and I are so passionate about this topic. Mm, Thank you. And Sandy, can you share a little about your experience? Yeah. So just briefly, I was born really prematurely at about you know, 14 weeks early, which was a lot. And then I was born chronically ill with a bowel condition. And I also have a physical disability called true palsy. And then I wasn't diagnosed with OCD until I was 24. But looking back now, knowing what I do about OCD, I think I would say my OCD probably started around age three or something. So quite young as well. So you and you guys are talking about illnesses or medical conditions that create a lot of uncertainty in your life, which is so much of the work of managing OCD. How, oh, let's start with you, Jesse, again, like how do you manage the uncertainty of not having a diagnosis or trying to figure that out? Is, has that been a difficult process for you or how have you managed that? It has been such a difficult process. Yeah, because that's what OCD latches on to, right? Like the uncertainty of things. And that's been really challenging with not having a specific diagnosis. I can't say, oh, I have Crohn's disease or Lyme disease or something that kind of gives it a name and validates the experience. I feel like I have a lot of intrusive thoughts and my OCD will latch on to not having that diagnosis. So I'll have a lot of intrusive thoughts that maybe I'm making it up because if the blood work is coming back normal, then, you know, what is it? And so I'll have to often fight off those intrusive thoughts and really practice mindfulness and do a lot of ERP surrounding that to really validate my experience and not let those get in the way. So Sandy, I can only imagine, you know, for both of you, that is the case as well. How has your anxiety impacted your ability to manage the medical side of your symptoms? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question because I think that both my OCD and my medical symptoms are linked. I think when I, you know, when I get really stressed and have like prolonged periods of stress, my bowel condition especially gets a lot worse. So that's tricky. But I think, you know, I've sort of learned as I've gone through ERP and I'm now in OCD recovery that, you know, a lot of the skills I've learned from being chronically ill and disabled my whole life, like, you know, planning, you know, being, being a good self-advocate at the doctors or at the hospital and that, that flexibility, I think those kind of tools really help me to cope with the challenges of have, uh, having additional anxiety on top of those medical challenges. Right. And so is it true that it's both ways for you in terms of the con- of course, I believe this to be from my own experience of having chronic illnesses, the condition itself creates anxiety even for people who don't have an anxiety disorder. So h- how have you managed that additional anxiety that you're experiencing? Is there a specific tool or skill that you want to share with people? And then I'll let Jesse chime in as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is it was realizing that my journey is my journey and it might be like a little slower than other people's because of all the complicating factors, but it's still like a good journey and it's it's just, it's my journey. So I can't really like sort of wish myself into someone else's shoes. I'm in my own shoes. And I guess the biggest thing is sort of realizing like, you know, my OCD isn't special because I have these complicating factors even though I myself am special, my OCD is just sort of -of run-of-the-mill OCD and can still be treated by ERP despite those medical issues as well. Right. How about you, Jesse? What's your experience of that? Yeah. Well, I'd like to add to what Sandy had said too about the skills from ERP really helping. One of the things I feel like I've gone through is there's so much waiting in chronic illness. Like You're waiting for the doctors to get back to you. You're waiting for 
test results. You're waiting for the phone schedulers to answer the phone and not be on like the, I feel like I've memorized like the music for the waiting um, of all the different (laughs) doctors. Um, But there's a lot of waiting. And that's really frustrating because the waiting is uncertain. You're just waiting to get an answer, which typically in my case, and probably Sandy's and yours as well, then just adds more uncertainty anyways. But I remember one of the tools that's really helped me is staying in the present, which I'm not great at. But I remember I had to get an MRI where you literally can't move. Like there's only the present. Like you're there with your thoughts. Your like arms are in. You can't move at all. And it was really long. It was like 45 minutes long. And I remember just thinking like the colors, like what do I see? I see blue. I see red. I thought I had to like think of things because then my eyes are closed. And I was thinking of different shapes of like, oh, in the room before I saw there was a cylinder shape and there was a cube. And that's really helped me to stay in the present, especially with those like really long waiting periods. For sure. Yeah. The dreaded MRI machine. I can totally resonate (laughs) with what you're saying. It's all mindfulness. It's either mindfulness or you go down a spiral, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. You guys are talking about skills when it comes to many, because I think there's the anxiety of having these chronic illness or a disability or a medical condition. What about how you manage the emotions of it and what kind of emotions show up for you in that living with these difficult, difficult things that you're experiencing. Sandy, do you want to share a little about the emotional side of having a chronic illness or a disability? Yeah. So I think the first thing that shows up for me emotion wise, or did at least when I sort of started to process the idea that I have a disability and I have this chronic illnesses and it's going to be a lifelong thing was I was sort of in my undergraduate university and I really hadn't thought much about what it's like to, like I had thought about having a disability, but I hadn't thought about the fact that I needed to process that this is a lifelong thing and it's going to be challenging my whole life. So I think when I started to process that, the grief really showed up because I had to grieve this life that I thought I should have of being able-bodied or, you know, medically healthy or, you know, mentally well, I guess. And I had to really grieve that but I think that that grief shows up like sometimes unexpectedly for me too, because sometimes I feel like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I moved past this thing that happened. But then because it's an ongoing process to navigate chronic illness and disability, the grief shows up again, you know, at unexpected times. I think the other thing too I've sort of navigated was a lot of like shame around the idea that I should be like quote unquote normal. But of course, I can't really control how I was born and, you know, the the difficulties I've had. And I think something that really helps me there is sort of bringing in the self-compassion. And I do think that compassion really is sort of an antidote to shame because when you bring something out to the the forefront and say like you know this is something that I've experienced it was challenging you know but I can still move forward uh, I think that really helps or at least it helps me yeah I agree Jesse what are your experiences yeah I would say the first two words I thought of were frustration and loneliness I think there's a lot of frustration kind of in two different ways. The first way being like, why is this happening? Like, first I had OCD. And then now I have this other thing that I have to deal with. And it's a lot of as Sandy was saying before, there's a lot of self advocacy that has to happen when you're chronically ill, or at least that I've experienced where you have to stand up for yourself, you have to kind of finagle your way into doctor's appointments and to get the treatment that you deserve. But there's also the frustration that both OCD and my chronic illness, I guess, are invisible. So I look totally fine, right? Like I look like someone else walking down the street who, you know, might be completely healthy. And I often feel frustrated that as like a 23 year old, like a person who is like a young adult, that I'm having to constantly go to these doctor's appointments and advocate for myself and practice ERP, which is not, you know, always the most fun thing to do. So it's frustrating to constantly 
have to explain it because you don't see it. And then that kind of goes together with the loneliness of being a young adult and being pretty much the only person in the doctor's offices and waiting rooms who isn't an older adult or who, you know, isn't elderly. And then they get confused. And then I get confused. Like it it just kind of then goes back to my OCD. Well, then attack that like, well, everyone else is older. What are you doing here? So I, I would definitely say loneliness. And I just forgot the other thing. I was <laughs> good. Loneliness and frustration. Yeah. 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 I resonate with what you're saying. I agree with everything both of you are saying. And for me too, I had to really get used to feeling judged. Like I had to sort of get good at feeling judged. Even though I didn't even know if they were judging me, but that feeling that I was being judged, maybe it's more magical thinking and so forth, but that, you know, someone will say like, I'll I have to explain to someone why I can't do something. And as I'm explaining it, I'm just, I have a whole story of what they're thinking about me. And that was a really difficult part to get through at the beginning of like, you're going to have to let them have their opinions about you. Who knows what they're thinking? And that was, that was a really hard piece for me as well. So I, I love that you both brought in the frustration and the loneliness, because I think that's there. I love that we also bring in the grief. And I agree, Sandy, And Jesse, do you agree in terms of that grief wave just comes at the most random times? Absolutely. Yeah, it can be so, so painful. So let's go back to talking about the how the sort of this interlocking web of how anxiety causes the chronic illness to get worse sometimes, the chronic illness causes anxiety to get worse sometimes. Sandy, have you found any way that you've been able to sort of have a better awareness of what's happening? How do you work to pull them apart or do you not worry about pulling them apart? Yeah, I think there's, I have a few strategies. So I do try to write everything down. I make notes upon notes upon notes of, you know, this day I had these symptoms and you know, I I do sort of automate a lot of tasks in the fact that like, I have like a medication reminder on my phone. So it reminds me to take my pills instead of just having to remember it off the top of my head. And I also like, something that really helps is sort of trying to remember that things that work for other people might actually also work for me too. Because it's like, yeah, sure, maybe as me as a person, I'm unique. And like, my medical situation is interesting or different or whatever. But like a lot of good advice for other people, like, especially for mental health works for me too. Like, you know, like getting outside, even if I feel really not great, and I'm really tired, or in a lot of pain, just like getting outside, you know, anytime I have my shoes on, and I'm just like, outside, even for five minutes, I count that as a win. You know, drinking a lot of water for me, that helps us too. And of course, like I'm wary and saying all this that like, because a lot of people might just say, oh, well, you know, Jesse and Sandy, they just need to do like more yoga and that'll just cure them. And of course, it's not that simple. It, It's not a cure all. But at the same time, like I try to remember that at least for me, like I have a, like common medical issues uh, that a lot of different people have. So I can sort of pull on, you know, like literature and different things that have worked for other people with my conditions. And yeah, maybe other people haven't had this exact constellation that I do, but I can still pull on the, you know, the support and resources from other people too. Yeah. How about you, And if I could add there, I'm not as good as differentiating. I can kind of tell, like, I know when things are starting to get compulsive, which I actually appreciate that I had had so much ERP training before I got sick because I really like know what's a compulsion, what's an obsession, and I can tease that out. But a lot of my treatment has also been really understanding, like, maybe I don't need to know if this is my chronic illness, or if this is my OCD, because then that gets compulsive. So I've kind of had to sit in that uncertainty of maybe it is one, maybe it is the other, but I'm not going to figure it out. Yeah. You read my mind because as as you were both talking, I was thinking the most difficult part for many um, people that I see in my practice is trying to figure out and balance between advocating, going to the doctor when you need, 
but also not doing it from a place of being compulsive because health anxiety and OCD can have you into the doctor surgery every second day or every second hour, right? Um, how can you, how are you guys navigating that of, you know, advocating, but at the same time, keeping an eye on that compulsivity that can show up? Sandy, do you want to go first? Yeah. So I honestly haven't figured out like the perfect formula between trying to figure out like, you know, is this sort of anxiety around the potential that I might be getting sick again? And it like compulsively trying to like get things checked out and and the idea like that I that I might have something actually medically going wrong that needs to be addressed. Like it's I find it still challenging to sort of tease those things apart. But I think something that does help is trying to remind myself like not what is normal because I don't think normal really exists. But what is in the service of my recovery? So yeah, I can't have recovery from my disability or my my chronic illnesses, but I can have OCD recovery. And so I'm always still trying to think to myself, you know, like, you know, how can I move forward in a way that both aligns with my values and allows me to move forwards towards my recovery? How about you, Jesse? Oh, it's so hard to follow that, Sandy. I love that. I would say. I think it's kind of tough because a symptom that I have is like, I was never really a big compulsive Googler, but I know in OCD world, it's kind of like, don't go to Google for medical issues. Like Google is not your friend, but for my chronic illness recovery or chronic illness journey, Google's kind of been important. Like I've had to do a lot of research on like, what is it that I possibly have? And Um, That really helps me advocate my case to the doctors because I've had some great doctors, but they're not spending hours like reading medical journals and trying to figure it out to the extent that I care about it because it's my situation and I want to figure stuff out. And Googling has actually helped me a lot in that regard and joining different like Facebook groups and actually getting like hearing from other people what their experiences have been. I know Sandy and I started a special interest group, which hopefully we'll talk about a little later, but someone in the group had mentioned that something that really helps them is the like community of their doctors and their therapists working together of, oh, I'm going to wait two days if I have this symptom. And if it's still a symptom that's really bothering me and my therapist you know, thinks it should be checked out, then I'm going to go to the doctor. And having that those people who are experts kind of guiding you and helping you with making sure, no, this isn't compulsive. Like this is a real medical thing that needs to be checked out. And I thought that was really smart and seemed to work for her. So I'd imagine it would work for other people as well. If I can add one more thing, it would just be that, you know, while there's so many experts on like OCD and ERP and, you know, your chronic medical issues or your disability or whatever it is for you, you are the only like frontline expert in your own experience of, you know, your mind and your body. And you're the only one who knows what it's like to exactly be in that, I guess, space So while I I 100% think, you know, therapy is important, like evidence-based treatments are important, I do also think like remembering when you when you think like, oh, you know, this is really hard or I can't cope, it's like actually like you can cope, you're capable, and you know yourself best. And I think that's challenging because I know sometimes in like ERP for people who maybe don't have other complicating medical challenges, they would say like, you know, don't Google. But I think like as just Jesse has explained, like sometimes because we have other chronic stuff going on, we do need to do things to help, you know, our self like holistically too. Yeah. And, and I love that. And you guys, I'll speak from my own experience. And if you guys want to weigh in, please do, is I had to always do a little intention check before I went down into Google, right? Like, okay, am I doing this because anxiety wants me to do it? Or am I doing it because this will actually move me towards being more informed? Or will this actually allow me to ask better questions to the doctor or, you know, and so forth? And it is a tricky line because Google is the algorithm 
end websites are set to sometimes freak you out, right? Like there's always that piece at the bottom that says it, or it could be this, this, or this, or it could be cancer. And that always used to like freak me out, right? Because that was something that I was, you know, the doctors were concerned about as well. So do you guys have any experience on how, you know, how did you make that decision on, and this might be beyond just Googling, but in terms of many areas, how did you, how did you make the decision on whether it was compulsive or not? Jesse? Yeah. And another area, well, it's, it's tough too, right? Cause then you're down the rabbit hole. Like you've already been Googling and it's like, or this, and I'm like, well, I have to figure out what that is. And sometimes it does get a little compulsive and then like the self-compassion and also like realizing it like, okay, now it's getting compulsive and I'm going to stop and, and, you know, go about my day. But another thing that I've struggled with is the like relationship with doctors. And Sandy and I have talked about this before with like, wanting to be the quote, like perfect patient. So I worry that I'm messaging them too much, or I am, I'll I'll often now avoid messaging them, because then, you know, I don't want to be too annoying of a patient, like I can't be the perfect patient if I'm messaging them all the time. And it really is, like you said, like, the intention, like, am I messaging them, because I want to move forward with this, and I like want an answer? Or am I messaging them because there's a reason to message them? And I need their like medical advice. So there's just so much gray in it. And again, not necessarily having that specific answer or having that like, yeah, it can be very tricky. It truly can. How about you, Sandy? I think The biggest thing for me, and I'm still trying to figure out the right balance for this, is sort of weighing, you know, how urgent is this medical symptom? Like, am I, I don't know, I don't want to like say something that would put someone into a tailspin, but like, am I like doing something, like, is, do I have a medical symptom going on right now that needs urgent attention? If so, maybe I should go to my doctors or the ER. But, you know, is, or is the urgency more like mental health related, like feeling like an OCD need to get that reassurance or need to know and just sort of separating the urgency of the medical issue that's going on right this second to the versus the urgency in my head. Amazing. Amazing. So you guys have created special interest group and I'd like to know a little more about that. I know you have more wisdom to tell and I want to get into that here a little bit more, but before you do like share with us, how important has that part of, um, you know, creating this special interest, how has that benefited? What What's your goals with that? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so Sandy and I actually met in an online OCD support group. And I found those online groups to be really helpful for my OCD recovery. And mostly with feeling less shame and stigma, met some amazing people clearly. And then I remember Sandy had mentioned and one of the different groups that she had a chronic illness. And when I was going through my chronic illness journey, I felt really alone. As I was saying before, like the loneliness is one of the biggest emotions that I had to deal with. And I looked online for like, now I'm like, online support groups are my thing. Like, let's just Google chronic illness support groups. And I thought it would be, you know, as easy as OCD support groups. And it wasn't, it was very challenging. And it was really hard to find one. I found one that was state based. So it was for my state. It was me and three women who were, I think one was in their 80s, the other two were in their 90s. And they were very sweet. But we were at very different like, lifestyle (laughs) um, changes, you know, we were going through very different experiences. And I remember I reached out to Sandy and I said, you know, do you have any chronic illness support groups that you've been attending? And even in that group with the elderly women, we, there were so many things that they were saying that helped them with their chronic illness. And my OCD would totally have latched onto all of it. Like, I was like, I can't do that with my OCD. Like, there's so much overlap that it just seemed like there needed to be this dual, you know, chronic illness and OCD. And so Sandy had said she had, you know, the same issue, like it was really hard to find these groups. 
Um, and I think we're really lucky in that the International OCD Foundation was such a good partner for us. And they were so kind in helping us get this special interest group started. And I'm interested to hear what Sandy says, but it's been so helpful for me to see that there are other people who deal with a lot of these challenges. And of course, you know, I wouldn't want anyone else to have to have these experiences, but being able to talk about it, being able to share has just been so helpful. And I was really quite amazed to see the outreach we had and like how many people struggle with this and that there really weren't any resources. So it's been pretty amazing for me. And I'm really lucky that we've been able to have this experience. I think that it's been like, it's like similar to Jesse, I had found some resources for OCD support groups, both locally to me in Ontario and online. And that was great. Like that really, that sense of community really helped my OCD recovery. But then when it came to the chronic illness disability part, you know, there was just a gap. So as Jesse said, we started the special interest group and it's, it's, I think it's called, and Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's chronic illness slash disability plus OCD is our official title. And so basically it's for anyone. Yeah, it really um, goes off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> it's for anyone who has a chronic illness or disability and OCD or is a clinician who's interested in learning more. And our goals really is to set, to create a community, but also create resources for the wider OCD community to help you know, people who are struggling with chronic illness or disability and OCD or, you know, clinicians. Yeah. So the the sense of community has been great. And I think for my own sort of recovery, OCD wise, it's been like, it's been really motivating to, to be able to, you know, help, you know, found and facilitate this group because, it showed me that I really don't have to be this, like in this perfect state of recovery to have something valuable to contribute. You know, I just sort of have to show up in an imperfect way and do my best. And and that is enough in itself. And that the fact that like, you know, I don't have to get an A plus in recovery because that's not even a thing you can get. You know, I just have to, you know, keep trying every single day <laughs> and try to live my values. And I think this six has been a great opportunity to sort of like embody those values as well, of like community and advocacy. So it's, it's just been great. Oh, I love it so much. And it is such an important piece. I actually find the more I felt like I was in community, that in and of itself managed my anxiety, right? Because that it, it it was very interesting how just being like, oh, I'm not alone. It for some reason the, my anxiety hated this idea that I was alone in this struggle. So I I totally just love that you're getting this group, and I'll make sure that all of the links are in the show notes so people can actually access, um, you know, you guys and get connected. Extra question before I I want to round this out is. How do you guys manage the, I'm going to use the word ridiculous, but the ridiculous advice you get of people who haven't been what you've been going through? Because I thought I've found it actually in some cases it to be quite even hilarious, the suggestions I get offered. Again, I know patients and clients have had a really difficult time because they might haven't been suggested an option and then their anxiety attaches to like, well, you you should do that and so forth. Sandy, do you want to go first in sharing your experience with quote unquote ridiculous advice? Yeah. So I guess to give a brief example, um, you know, a practitioner who I've worked with for quite a while, who I think is great and a wonderful person and wonderful practitioner had sort of you know, in the last couple months suggested that maybe I should just, you know, try essential oils to manage my bowel condition. And what actually was needed was sort of like hospitalization and surgery. So it's that kind of advice from both, you know, well-meaning practitioners or, you know, just people in my life that can be, you know, not what you need to hear and maybe not as supportive as as they're hoping it would be. And I guess for me, I manage it mostly by saying, you know, you know, thank you. That's, that's a great idea, even when it's not really a great idea. And I just sort of say like to myself or, you know, maybe like to a support person later, like, you know, that was not the best advice. And, you know, and like, just like debriefing it with someone I think is really helpful. Someone that I trust. Yeah. Yeah, Kimberly, I love this. I I think Sandy, our next sig, we should we should ask this. And 
hear all the ridiculous advice that people have been given because it's true. Like there's so many things that are so ridiculous. I'm going to shout out my mom here who I love more than anything in the world. But even my mom who like lives with me some of the time and like sees like what I go through. One time (laughs) she called me, she's going to kill me, but she called me and she said, she was like, I heard that there's a half moon, something with the moon. Like I heard there's a half moon at 1030 AM your time. And if you stand outside, it will heal some of your like rear rash. And I was like, what? (laughs) Like, that's absurd. And she was like, I know, I think it's absurd too, but you need to do this for me. And uh, like with that, you see like the pain, like she just wants me to get better. And uh, as Sandy was saying, like people really want to help and this is a way they think they can help. I've also been told like, oh, if you mash up like garlic and then you like put like it was like this weird recipe then like you want a headache like just like kind of like ridiculous things but people are really well-meaning and they want to help and unfortunately those often don't really help but now I can laugh about it and now text my mom and be like you'll never guess what so and so said um or text Sandy and we could have a good laugh about it but that's what's nice about community is you're like, wait, am I the only, should I do this essential oil thing? And then you realize from others, like, no, like, that's probably not the best route to go. It plays on this, uh, for me, with anxiety, self-doubt is a big piece of the puzzle, right? Like, I ha- self-doubt is one of the loudest voices. And so when someone would suggest that, I would have a voice that would say, it's not going to hurt you to try. And so, so I, and then I would feel this immense degree of self-doubt, like, should I? Should I not? What do you think? It's not, you could try. You should try. And I'm like, but I I literally don't have time to go and stand in the sun and do the thing or in your example. And I would get in my head a back and forth on decision making. Like, should I or shouldn't I? I, It wouldn't hurt. It sounds ridiculous, but maybe I should. Like, and that was such a, a compulsive piece of it that would get me stuck for quite a while. And it's often when it would be from a medical professional, because it really would kind of make you question yourself. So I fully resonate with that. And I I think it's fun. Sometimes I wish I could do like a hilarious Instagram post on like all of the amazing advice I've been given (laughs) throughout the time of having POTS. Like it's some of it's been ridiculous. Let me ask you finally, what advice would you give somebody who has an anxiety disorder and is at first the beginning stages of not, you know, having these symptoms and not knowing what they are. Jesse, will you go first? Yeah, I would say a big thing as we've kind of been talking about is finding that community, whether that be reaching out to us with the SIG or whether that be finding a Facebook group or online group or whatever it may be, because it has helped me so much to reach out and be in community with others who really understand there's nothing like people who truly get it. And then I would say to to validate, like, this is really tough. Like, having OCD is tough. Having a chronic illness or disability is tough. And having both is very, very tough. And validate those symptoms too. Because I think there's a lot of people that will say like, oh, you have an anxiety disorder, like you're probably making that up. And that comes up a lot. And so just kind of validating that and really trying to find other people who are going through it, because I I think that's just irreplaceable. Sandy? Yeah, I think the biggest thing to echo Jesse would be try to find community. And I think for me, you know, for my OCD recovery journey, like, Instagram has particularly been great because there's so many wonderful OCD advocates or clinicians on Instagram. It's really sort of a hub for the OCD community. So I would say, you know, check out Instagram. And, you know, once you follow a couple of people from, you know, the OCD community, the algorithm will sort of show you more. So it's nice that way. I think the other thing is that, you know, being disabled or 
having a chronic illness can really chip away at your confidence. So just sort of reminding yourself that, you know, you're doing the best you can in a really hard situation. And yeah, it, you know, it, it may be sort of a long-term situation, but just because, you know, your life is different than other people doesn't mean that it's not going to be a great life. I'm actually going to shift because I wanted to round it out then, but I actually have another question. Recently, we had Dr. Ashley Smith on talking about how to be happy during adversity. I'm curious how, I'll go with you, Sandy, first, because you just said, how do you create a wonderful, joyful life while managing not only an anxiety disorder, but also chronic illness or disability? What have you found to be helpful in that concoction per se. Yeah. And I, I listened to that episode with Dr. Smith and that was a wonderful episode. So if people haven't listened to it, I recommend it. I listened to it twice because it was, I just wanted to go back and like, you know, pick out the really interesting parts. So, but I think for me, the the combination of finding things that are both like meaningful from a values and an acceptance and commitment therapy act uh, perspective. So meaningfulness, finding those things that matter to me, but also finding the things that challenge me. And, you know, if I'm having a really bad pain day or fatigue day, the things that challenge me might, might just be getting out of bed, you know, or maybe, you know, I'm really depressed and that's why I can't get out of bed either. Or is, you know, it's your experience is valid and just sort of like validating your own experience and bringing in that self-compassion and saying, you know, what is something that can challenge me today and bring me a little closer to recovery? You know, even if it's going to be a long journey, what's this like one small thing I can do and break it down for yourself? Yeah. Amazing. I love that. What about you, Jesse? I would say I've been able to find new hobbies. Like I'm still the same person. I'm still doing other things that I found meaningful. And this doesn't, well, it is a big part of my life. It's not my entire life. Like I'm still working and hanging out with friends and doing things that regularly bring me happiness. But just like a small example, I said before, like I used to play sports and love, you know, being really active and that gets a little harder now. Um, But something I found that I really love is paint by numbers because they're so easy. Like they're fun. They're easy. You don't have to be super artistic, which is great for me. And I'm able to, you know, just sit down and do the paint by numbers. Even recently I had friends over and it was kind of like a rainy day and we all kind of did like a craft. And so even though it was a really like high pain day for me, like I was in a flare of medical symptoms, I was still able to engage with things that I find meaningful and live my life. I love that. Thank you. That That's so important, isn't it, to sort of round your life out around the disability or the chronic illness or your anxiety. I love that. Okay. Any final words that you want to give in terms of, we talked about like those early stages of diagnosis, any other thing that you feel I we need to, we absolutely have to mention before we finish up? Sandy? I guess to to quote someone you've had on the podcast before, Reverend Katie, I, I find her content amazing and she's just a lovely person. But she always says, you know, you know, you are a, a special person, but your OCD is not special. Your OCD isn't isn't like fundamentally different or gonna it's gonna be like never gonna be get better. You, like you gotta remember that you are this special person and your OCD doesn't want you to sort of recognize that you're you are the thing that's special, not it. So just sort of be able to separate yourself from your, you know, anxiety disorder or your chronic illness or your disability and saying like, you know, like I'm still me and I'm still awesome, sort of you know, and these things are just one part of me. Yeah. So true. I'm such a massive Katie fan. So um, that's excellent advice. Jesse. Yeah, to kind of go the other route, I think you said, right, with people who are first going through this, I would say we recently did a like a survey of our SIG. So people who have chronic illness and OCD and the thing that really stood out, we like haven't like done all the data yet, but like the thing that really stood out was we asked a question like, have you ever felt invalidated by a medical professional or mental health professional? And every single person said yes. And then kind of explained. And some people had a lot to say too. And I think 
I've really learned in this process that you have to be a self-advocate. It's very challenging to be an advocate when you're going through a mental disorder, physical disability, or both, and or both. And it, it's kind of required. <laughs> so um, really standing up for yourself because it, it's going to be a tough journey. And there's so much light in the journey too. Like there's so many positive things and, you know, so much quote happiness from the episode before, but there's also a lot of difficulty that can come from being in kind of the medical world as well as the mental health world and really trying to navigate both of them and putting them together. So really try to advocate for yourself or find someone who could help you advocate for yourself and your case, because I think that'll be really helpful. Yeah, so true. You guys are so amazing. Okay. Jesse, why don't you go first? Tell us where people can get resources or get in touch with you or the SIG and then Sandy, if you would follow. Yeah. So we have an Instagram account where we'll post, we're, we're, we're experiencing with Canva. So we're really, we're really uh, working on Canva and getting some graphics out there about the different things that come up when you have both of these conditions. And then that's where we kind of post our updates for the special interest group. So it's called, it's at, Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong, chronically.courageous is our Instagram handle. And then in there, the link is in our bio to sign up for the special interest group. That just sends us, you, uh, you get put on our email list and then you'll get all the emails we send with the Zoom links and everything. And then you could also go to the International OCD Foundation's website and look at the special interest groups there and you'd find ours there. And I, I the, the other you thing is we meet twice a month. So we meet quite frequently and we'd love to have you. So please, you know, check out our Instagram or get added to your email list and we would love you to join. You guys, you make me so happy. Thank you for coming on the show. I'm so grateful we're having this conversation. I feel like it's way overdue, but thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.